morning, church. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Seo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Ricefield United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service this morning. And also, I want to um, welcome everyone who are joining us um, our worship service through Facebook Live. Um, we believe you will encounter God through today's worship service. Today, we have several announcements to share with you. So first of all, this coming Saturday, we have empty nesters and friends gathering. Um, so if you want to join here, please RSVP to Donna Pinkney. And next Sunday, we have a movie show and discussion time led by Racial Unity Group. So movie show starts at 1.30 p.m. and discussion starts at 3.15 p.m. Um, so please um, email Pastor Julia for more information if you are interested in this program. In Friday, July 26, we have a low country boil event led by the United Women in Faith. Oh, it made me so hungry. So you can purchase tickets between services or also you can get the tickets um, in the church office during weekdays. And Sunday, July 28, the trustees are hosting an informational meeting to share details um, about the plans for Ricefield United Methodist Church Memorial Garden. So please join us on Sunday, July 28 at 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And I think this is our first time to make this announcement verbally. In August, you are invited to evening with Doug and also church leaders, a.k.a. dinner with Doug. <laughs> yeah, dinner with Doug. I love that. Um, so we are going to share a meal, and also we are going to talk about um, our church's future. So we really need your thoughts, and you, we really need your opinion. So please uh, check the date and save the date. Um, these dinners will be held by age groups. So you can find more um, detailed information um, in the bulletin board in the hallway outside of the restrooms. So after this worship service, and you will go to upstairs. And uh, well, before that, uh, please check on the bulletin board um, for this gathering. And lastly, um, we really want to connect with you. So if you are new or new here, please um, take a moment to fill out connect card. And also, if you have any update, like new uh, phone number, new email address, please kindly update your information by filling out the connect card. Now, let us prepare our hearts before God. Take a deep breath. And feel closer to our Lord.
I come with joy to meet my Lord, forgiven, loved, and free, in all and wonder to recall his life laid down for me, his life laid down for me. Good morning. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here. And we do come with joy this morning into this place to worship our God. And yet I also know that uh, many of us come very aware of the pain and suffering in the world and perhaps having seen things that have happened in our country over just the past 24 hours or so that might feel very frightening or um, unsettling to us. And so we come now into this place to be reminded always of Jesus's call to us to put down our swords, and we're grateful for that. Will you join me now in our opening prayer, our congregational prayer that is found in your bulletin? Let's pray now these words together. Holy and loving God, in this hour of worship, open our ears to hear you our lips to praise you, our minds to understand you, our hearts to love you, and when we leave, our hands to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you now to stand as you're able in body or spirit as we join in our opening hymn, number 158, Come Christians, Join to Sing. as we affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. sit down, please greet those around you with the peace of Christ. I'd now like to invite Sadler Selby to come forward to share with us our psalm for July. Hi, I will be reading Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts. My King and my God, happy are those who live in your house ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you and whose hearts are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold for those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, Happy is everyone who trusts in you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a sacred time now in the life of our church when we get to celebrate the sacrament of holy baptism. So I'd like to invite the Nally family to come forward. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty act of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift, offered to us without price. So now I present Cooper Michael Nelly for a Christian baptism. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Do you? And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Will you? 
And do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Church, sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Church, declare his works to the nations his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and he who receives it, to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Cooper Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father <coughs> and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll lay hands on him. <laughs> Cooper Michael, the Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now it is our joy to welcome our new brother in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Well, Cooper, today is a big day. You're officially a part of the church. Yeah, that's worth smiling about, isn't it? <laughs> and everyone, meet Cooper. Cooper is the newest official Christian in our big, gigantic family. I want to tell you guys that a couple of really important things have happened today. The first is that God has made a promise to Cooper that no matter what happens, no matter what he goes through in his life, God is going to be there guiding Cooper and protecting him and loving him no matter what. <laughs> the second thing that's really important is that Cooper's parents have promised that they are going to help to raise up Cooper in the way that he should go by their example and through raising him within this community of faith. And finally, I don't want you all to forget that you all just made a promise as well, which is that you are going to love Cooper and that you are going to help to raise him up and love him when he's crying a little bit. You're going to be his Sunday school teachers and his confirmation mentors. You're going to volunteer and wiggle worship so that he has somewhere to go if he's feeling a little bit fussy. And when he is in worship with us, you are going to smile and be so grateful 
that he is here with us. So we rejoice with you and your family today. And one of the promises that we all made was that we would pray for Cooper. And so uh, Pastor Doug is going to help us to do that right now. Let's all extend a, a hand toward Cooper. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for Cooper Michael. Lord, we ask that your grace would fall upon him and also upon his family. You've picked uh, two great parents to raise him up and to have the responsibility of uh, helping to shape his life and to help him to uh, gain the faith that, um, that we are um, starting today. Uh, Father, I pray that um, as he continues to grow, um, Lord, that his faith will grow as well. And Lord, that he will, um, his relationship with you will only grow stronger each and every day. Lord, go with him, uh, beside him, behind him, surround him with your steadfast love. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you so much. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of power, love, and power. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will take me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome God's free bounty glorified. True belief and true repentance, every grace that brings you nigh. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will take me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you wait until you're better, you will never come at all. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will take me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will take me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are 10,000 charms. Let us go before God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we come before you with humble heart, seeking your presence and your guidance. We give you thanks for your endless love and grace that renew us each day. Lord, we ask for your wisdom and discernment in our lives and in our community. Help us to understand the depth of your love and to extend that love to others. Teach us to be patient, kind, and compassionate, even when we face differences. Remind us that we are one body in Christ, called to live in unity and peace. Lord, we lift up our high school youth mission team serving in El Salvador. Let them be channels of your love, and may the people they encounter experience your love through their hands of service. Protect them and guide them in every step of their journey until they safely return home. <coughs> Lord, we pray for our country and community. May it become a place where everyone can freely express their thoughts and opinions without fear of violence. Let your justice, your righteousness, and your peace reign in this country. 
And may we, as your people, be prayerful, seeking shalom of all. Lord, we lift up our burdens and our concerns to you. Especially now, we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who are suffering, bring your healing and comfort. For those who are lost, shine your light upon their path. For those who are weary, grant them rest and renewal. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sue. Before we have the ushers come forward to take up the offering, um, I'd like to just take a, a minute. Um, we've just reached the halfway point in the year, and I thought it'd be a good time for us to assess where we are. So if you would turn with me to the back of your bulletin, to the financial report, I'd just like to point that out to you really quickly. I'm not quite so concerned about what has been budgeted up to this point, but I would like for you to look at revenues received at $889,000 and actual expenditures at $911,000. So a difference of about $22,000 where we are behind. Now, um, our budget's $1.8 million, so $22,000 is not an emergency. Um, at this point in the year, it's just a little more than 2%. But um, I'd love for it, uh, with all the amazing ministries and programs that we have in this church, it'd be great if that, um, if that number didn't continue to, uh, to get larger. So I had an, I, I'm going to say something that I've never said before, and I may never say again. But, um, but I'm going to um, invite you to help um, with that $22,000 deficit. There are about 1,000 people who are going to participate in worship today, either in person or online. And so if, uh, if each of us were to add an additional $22 to our giving for today, um, we could make up that $22,000 deficit in uh, one Sunday. So, uh, so that's what I'm suggesting. If you normally give $20, if you might consider a one-time gift of $42, if you normally give 100, if you might consider giving 122. If you normally give 500, give 522. Uh, you see how that goes. So a, a one-time additional gift of $22 to help us make up um, from that deficit would go a long way to continue the ministries and programs that we do here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this time. And now will the ushers come forward to receive our offering.
children's sermon if there's any kids who'd like to come join me down front. everyone doing today? Doing pretty good? Fabulous. I'm so happy to see all of you today. Thanks for coming down. I'm Pastor Julia, and I have a question for you. Can you raise your hand and tell me something that you think Christians do? <laughs> what do we do that makes us like Christians? <laughs> Any of our big kids? Oh, yeah. You have an idea. Pray. Pray. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah? Help the community. Excellent answer. Yes. Anyone else want to throw one out there? Okay. Well, we can all, this, as I put you on the spot. I'll, I'll tell you that. I put you on the spot. Well, you are actually really onto something because I wanted today to talk about the fact that something that Christians do is we help each other. And you're right on, on it with helping the community because we don't just help uh, the people who are here on a Sunday and we don't just help the people who live by us or the people who look like us or act like us or think like us. We take care of everybody. So if there's someone that we see who doesn't have everything that they need and we can help, part of being a Christian means that we want to help them, right? So I wanted to tell you guys today about one way that we do that here at Wrightsville, and that's really, really easy to be a part of. Does that sound good? Okay, so we have something really cool at Wrightsville called the Grace Place. The Grace Place. Now, you might have walked by the Grace Place and not even known that that's what it was. It's some shelves that are underneath our stairway that goes up to the fellowship hall or to where like all the Sunday school classrooms are. And uh, if you go there after the service, you'll notice it's a little, it's, it's looking a little spiffy right now. We have a pretty new sign, it's really cool. So let me tell you how it works. On those shelves, there's baskets just like these. And what you can do is put something in one of those baskets that's gonna help the rest of our community. So. Over there, there's these sheets that get updated that has what some of the organizations that we work with most need. Um, and so you can take one of those while you go shopping. If you go like with your parents to the grocery store or to Target or Walmart or something, you can bring this with you. Or we have these really snazzy cards that you can take and have with you or your parents could put in their wallet. Um, and you can just scan a little QR code that shows you up to date what we most need. So I actually went out this week to get some things for the Grace Place and I wanted to tell you guys what that looked like. So I decided um, I was out at the grocery store and I wanted to get some things that would help people. So the first thing I got is a bottle of apple juice because I saw on the list that Mother Hubbard's Cupboard that gives food to people who don't have enough food at home uh, needs big bottles of juice that aren't glass. So I said, okay, that's easy. So we got some juice. And then the other one, this might be a little surprising, but this is a stick of deodorant. And that's because we work with some schools where there's a lot of kids who don't have everything that they need at home. And so sometimes they don't have enough soap or enough toothbrushes and toothpaste or deodorant. And I don't know about you, but I think it's really hard to learn if you feel stinky. And so we think that we should make sure that everybody has what we need. So I got a stick of deodorant for some, that will go to some kids who, who need that. And let me tell you, this was so easy to do, but I felt really, really good because I know that now there's someone who needs apple juice who's gonna have some apple juice, because I, I picked some up, and someone who's gonna have deodorant, because I could do that. It was really easy. So I actually am gonna give all of you one of these cool cards, and you can take it home with you, and um, 
hold on to it, or you could give it also to your grown-ups. Your grown will get one after the service. So this is just for you. I'm not even going to tell you to give it to them. You keep it. So you can have this, and it can remind you to think about the needs of others. And as I said to all of our big kids, uh, you will get one of these on your way out. And we'd love for you to take that with you and maybe go and check out the Grace Place and see how that works. Okay, so we are going to say an uh, echo prayer together. So I'm going to say a line, and I want you guys to echo it back to me. Can we do that? Awesome. Okay, let's, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Help me help others. I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for coming and spending this time with me. You can go back to your seats now. Again, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing our study of the book of Acts throughout the summer. Um, the book of Acts is kind of the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. And so what has taken place here is that uh, Jesus has ascended into heaven and he's left the disciples in charge to spread the good news of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, to start new churches from Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so they've gone out, and they've started new churches, and in Acts chapter 15, we come into a problem. And we will see a little bit about that problem if you'll turn with me again in your bulletin, this time to the sermon title. The very first church conference. Boy, that's a boring sermon title. Um... <laughs> I mean, what could be more exciting than talking about a church meeting? But uh, we're going to talk about the result, the outcome of that church meeting, which is extremely important. So let's look at Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it's necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, He's made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Today, we look for a word of grace. And Father, if there are words that are spoken that are by me that are not full of grace, I pray that I will be forgiven and that you will make everyone here today hear only your words and not mine. Lord, I ask this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, if there's one thing I think we can all agree on, it's that change is difficult. A lot of people I know are more comfortable putting up with old problems than finding new solutions. In fact, I'm probably one of them. I like a routine. 
They're kind of like the church I recently heard about that desperately needed a new sanctuary, but they were afraid to take the risk of building one. Actually, what happened was during a worship service, some plaster came down from the ceiling, hit the pastor on the head, and sent him to the hospital. Immediately, a meeting was called, and the church leaders made the following decisions. Number one, we are going to build a new church. Number two, we're going to build a new church on the same site as the old one. Number three, we're going to use the materials of the old church in order to build the new church. And four, we're going to worship in the old church until the new church is built. It seems people are open to change as long as it doesn't inconvenience them, cost them anything, or actually change the way they do business or live their lives. But change is what brings us to the 15th chapter of Acts. Bishop William Cannon in his commentary on the book of Acts says next to the description of Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts, this passage is the most important in the entire book. For what takes place here opens up for the church its largest field for expansion and makes possible the eventual winning of the Roman Empire to Christianity. From this point on, Christianity is not just part of a small Jewish sect, but rather it will become an independent movement growing into the New Testament church. Now the book of Acts, remember, is a birthday story. It's a story of the birth of the church, anyway. The church, as you know, was literally born on fire. God had sent the Holy Spirit to the first believers as tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people converted to Christianity in one day, and the church was off to the races. You see, contrary to all other religions, people were hearing for the very first time that salvation is not earned by being good, thinking good, or doing good. It's not about keeping the right rules, the right rituals, or even the right religion. Instead, salvation, or eternal life, is a gift of grace gained by faith. This message so empowered one man that, spiritually speaking, he became in fuego. He was formerly a Jewish hitman who'd made it his life's goal to stamp out the church and kill the message of Jesus Christ. But he met Christ on the road to Damascus, was miraculously converted, and now has become the most famous, passionate flamethrower in the church. Of course, I'm talking about Paul, and he just ended the first of his three missionary journeys in which he traveled over 1,400 miles by boat, by donkey, by foot, all over Asia Minor for the very first time, he'd taken the gospel not just to Jews but to Gentiles because Christianity was for everybody. This is not a Jerusalem thing. This is not a Jewish thing. This is a God thing. And Paul ends up in a city called Antioch, a Gentile city about 300 miles north of Jerusalem, and he settles there with another teacher named Barnabas. Together they were offering God's gift of grace, and these Gentiles were eagerly receiving it. Reports began to filter back into Jerusalem that all these Gentiles were becoming Christian, but they were not becoming Jewish first. As a male, in order to become Jewish, you had to be circumcised. These Gentiles are all being baptized, but not circumcised. Can you guess what happened? There arose in the church a cold water committee. As you know, the greatest danger to fire is water. And there were some people in the church that were ready to pour water on this fire that was spreading to the Gentiles. It was not that the Jewish believers didn't want them in the church. They did want them. But they wanted them in the church under their terms. They're raising some pretty important questions. Like... Can you have conversion without circumcision? Can you have faith in Christ without obeying the law of Moses? Can you believe in the Messiah without becoming a Jew first? Church was about to answer these questions once and for all. These are big questions that deserve big answers. How does a person enter into a permanent relationship with God? Who should be accepted in the church? Who gets in? What do you have to do to get in? What's required to become a member of God's family? 
It seems the river of God's grace had overflowed its Jewish banks. And now what's the church going to do about it? Welcome to Acts 15 and the most important business meeting in the history of the church. The entire future of Christianity is at stake. But what you're also going to find in this story are a few fire extinguishers. You're going to see why churches fight, why churches die, why people don't go to church, why people who used to go to church quit going to church, why a lot of people who keep going to church don't really like going to church. Because nothing will kill the heart, the spirit, the mission, the passion, or the effectiveness of the church greater than fire extinguishers. So one thing to take away from today's message is this. Make sure your Christian faith is fuel for the fire, not water on the fire. The scripture tells us, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate, I love that, no small dissension, and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Did you hear that word custom? We could probably uh, include the word tradition there instead of custom. You know, for thousands of years, every Jewish male had been circumcised. It's very plain that it was the sign of the covenant between God and his people. This is no small thing. This is a sacred and holy tradition. Now you have uncircumcised Gentiles who are giving their lives to Christ, following Jesus in baptism, becoming members of the church without surgery, and these Jewish believers are saying, wait a minute, before you can be saved, you've got to do one more thing. Can you imagine what that did to the new member class? I can just imagine the husband taking his wife and kids to this new church and they're all wanting to join, but then he finds out what he's required to do and you can't blame him for saying something like, Honey, I love this church too and I think it'd be great for you and the kids to be members, but I don't think this is the church for me. Now here in the 21st century, we're all sitting here going, Come on, right? I mean... You mean they're not going to let people into the church just because they don't look a certain way? A certain way that nobody else is ever going to see? That's exactly what these people were saying. Before you come into the church, you need to look like we think you ought to look, and you need to do things the way we think you need to get them done. In other words, they're saying, you've got to be just like us before you become one of us. Now, before we take these people to task, let's be honest. We all tend to settle in on our own particular version of what we think Christianity ought to be. I just think the, person, the pastor ought to always wear a coat and tie. Or how dare you have a church that doesn't have communion every single Sunday? You mean you don't sing Amazing Grace at 1125 every week? I understand there's nothing wrong with tradition, Tradition can be a very positive thing. It can also be a neutral thing. Sometimes it can be a bad thing. Here's how you know when tradition becomes a bad thing. When you put tradition over God's grace. When I was at Duke, I served a little church not too far away from the school. That church was on a steady decline. They had had 157 members 20 years before I arrived but we're down to 57 when I became its pastor. I talked to the leaders about ways to bring in new members when one of the leaders spoke up and said, I don't want any new members. They don't think like we do. Bless her heart. She was right. New members might not think like her, but the church isn't a club, and God's grace is for everybody. Paul and Barnabas realized that God's grace was for everybody, so they got involved into a very heated debate and discussion with these other folks. And they decided to take the question to the spiritual leadership in Jerusalem where the apostles and elders were. I call it the Jerusalem showdown. 
On the one side, you got legalism and rules, and on the other side, you got grace and faith. One side represented by the Pharisees, and if you read much in the New Testament, you'll see Pharisees all the time because they're always following Jesus around. Now, the term Pharisee technically refers to a first century group of religious leaders that are committed to a strict interpretation of the Mosaic law, and they insisted on meticulous observation of that law. I mean, these were good people. They just took things a little too far. So that the term eventually became synonymous with legalism. Now believe me when I tell you that legalism and Phariseeism is alive and well in every single church today. And if you don't know what a legalist is, let me share with you a definition I read that's both funny and true. First, that legalists love to act like God by making all the rules. Two, legalists also love rules about the rules. Legalists love rules about who gets to make the rules about the rules. Legalists love rules about who gets to enforce the rules made by the people whom the rules appointed to make the rules about the rules. Legalists really love rules about who gets to interpret the rules that rule. Legalists get perfectly euphoric when they get to enact the rules by punishing people who break the rules as interpreted by those appointed by the rules. In the end, legalists want to rule through rules and weld their rules like weapons to divide the church body into its many parts. You know, that's exactly what kept me from accepting God's call to be a pastor back in high school. I didn't think I was good enough. I was constantly trying to shape up, to do better, try harder. How miserable I was, what a nervous Christian I became. I figured that God had a record book that he kept in heaven. And on the page with my name, he had a line drawn down the center with debits on one side and credits on the other. On a good day, I might tally enough plus points to be pleasing and acceptable to God. On a bad day, I'd be afraid to go to sleep at night lest I not earn enough points to get to heaven if I should die before I wake. Kind of like the show The Good Place, if anyone's ever seen that. It was the greatest freedom in the world to be delivered from that kind of works righteousness. When I realized that I was never going to be good enough, but instead was forgiven and empowered to live a life that wasn't perfect, but rather was going on to perfection, I felt a marvelous deliverance. Forgiveness cannot be earned nor merited. It's already been given. We just have to accept it by faith. This is the problem facing the early church. These Pharisees were saying, if you want to be a Christian, you not only have to be circumcised, but you've got to keep all these laws and all these rules. You've got to obey the law of Moses. Today, we've substituted all kinds of rules for the law of Moses. We substituted made-up laws for the law of Moses. We got people today, if they could, that'd make it illegal to go into church wearing shorts and flip-flops. They'd make it illegal to drink a cup of coffee in the sanctuary. They'd make it illegal to sing anything other than hymns out of the hymn book. They really don't care about relationships. They just care about the rules. They really don't care whether people come to church or not as long as they come dressed the way they think they ought to be dressed, looking the way they think they ought to be looked, um, and, excuse me, the way they ought to look, and act like the way they think they ought to act, and do things the way they think they ought to do. You see, when we push tradition over grace, well, we become fire extinguishers. When you push rules over relationships, you are a fire extinguisher. Paul and Barnabas have shared the incredible things that God had been doing with the Gentiles as they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they were the new kids on the block. There were two people that the early church really needed to hear from. You know, back when I was a kid, there was a commercial from the financial advisor E.F. Hutton that went like this. When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. listen. That's right. It was time for the E.F. Huttons of the early church to speak up. Peter and James. First Peter. 
After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Paul understood that these Pharisees were right in their observations. They just weren't right in their conclusions. These Pharisees were saying, just look at these Gentiles. They don't always wash their hands before they eat. Well, the law says you got to. And when they do wash their hands, they don't eat right. They put shrimp on the barbie. (laughs) They put sausage on their pizza. They wear flip-flops in the synagogue. They may be clean, but they're not conformed to what we want and to what we think. And up to that point, the Pharisees were right. But Peter points out their fatal flaw. He says, you're focused on the external, not the internal. Listen to these verses again. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Did you hear that phrase, God who knows the heart? In the Greek language, there's a noun, cardionostis. Cardio, you know, means heart. Gnostis means knowledge. So it literally means a heart knower. God is our divine cardiologist. The difference is that a human cardiologist knows about the heart. But God knows the heart. He made the heart. This is what happens with legalists and Pharisees. They miss the heart of the matter of Christianity because Christianity is a matter of the heart. Whenever anyone walks in the church, the only thing that matters to God is not the color of their skin or the kind of clothes that they wear, but the condition of their heart. And Peter slams this point home with a sledgehammer. He says, now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believed we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. When Peter made this statement, mouths would have flown open, eyes would have popped out of their sockets, because here is Peter, the number one Jew, and everyone is expecting him to say something like, we believe that these Gentiles can be saved by grace through faith, just like us. But instead, he turned it around. And he said, we believe that even we Jews can be saved by grace, just like these Gentiles. In other words... In order to be saved, they don't have to become like us. We've got to become like them. (laughs) What matters is God's grace, not tradition. What matters is a relationship, not rules. What matters is the internal, not the external. Peter knew if you subtract from grace, it's no longer grace. And if you add to grace, then it's no longer grace. Our job is not to subtract from grace or add to grace. Our job is to divide grace up and multiply it so that everyone can have some grace. My prayer is that our church will be known throughout the Wilmington area as the place where everyone finds God's grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Holy and loving God, you have poured out your grace to us on the cross. Your Son, Jesus Christ, died so that we might live. Lord, help us to quit comparing someone else's worst to our best. And instead, extend grace to all those around us. You did it first to us. May we have the courage to do it to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our closing hymn today is uh, found on page 548. Um, Let's just sing the first verse of In Christ There Is No East or West.
first verse of 548. Let's stand and sing. Thank you for extending a little grace to me today. I see we ran past the hour. But uh, more importantly, let's extend grace to others. God has already extended his grace to us. Our job as Christians is to be gracious to the world around us. Go forth in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands.